Welcome to UnSchool and our um, disorientation meeting. So I've been calling them disorientation meetings very deliberately and intentionally because this experience we're going to take you through is very contrary to a lot of experiences that formalized traditional educations kind of told us how you should learn. So we're going to do it a little differently. If you can't hear me, do that and I'll try to make sure I'm loud enough. I don't have the natural PE voice. Um, we're also going to film this one if anyone's uncomfortable with that. Those are the two cameras. That's just because I had a bunch of people say they couldn't make it and I thought uh, the district was willing to film it. Great, then I can edit it and get it out to people that want to see this that didn't have the opportunity. So um, again, my name is Gabriel Cooper. Um, I am kind of the head of this thing, this learning environment that we're creating, UnSchool. Um, and what, when I started this about a year ago, um, you quickly realize that you're going to need a ton of help on getting the ideas. So I have kind of a design team of deviants, I call them. Um, and that's because the word deviant in my head, as I, when I was a teacher, I was always deviating from what the norm was told me that had to be done. I was always trying to find a different way, something to connect to kids differently, something that would drive education, something that would make them be passionate about learning. So I always called myself kind of a deviant in that way, and I've met them along the way other deviants, some less deviant, some more deviant, um, but they help me kind of continue to keep those ideas flowing. And we have Chris Watson over there, he's been a part of my team sharing ideas. He was actually at Arden years ago, so if any, anyone from here that might know him. We have John Lester who's part of my team, we have Nina Mancina sitting somewhere over oh, there. So, and there's others that have been a part of this along the way because I needed different credentials, different ideas, different I things that happen. So, to take you back on the little bit, um, I've been in the district 17 and a half years. Um, and before that, I was a student up to that point. So I, my whole life has been a part of education in some way. Um, what happened a year ago is the superintendent met with us, of some of us, a group of people, and it ended up being a conversation about we're losing students to different ideas. Some were going to charter, some were just walking, some were doing all different types of things. And he said, do we have any ideas? So at one point he kind of just looked at me and said, Gabe, if you'll do something, do something and, and we'll see what happens. So I actually went to him and said, okay Kent, what I need from you is complete autonomy. Because the things I'm going to tell the district that we might try to do are going to be things that are so like backwards to some things that you can't say no. You can question me, but I'll just keep kind of going and you can question me and be hard on me, but we've got to get to a point where I have enough autonomy to really listen to ideas. So that's kind of where this all began. I immediately got trained in how to be, um, run listening circles, listen to students, because what you're going to hear today comes from the most important person that I work with all the time, and that's our learners. That's our students that tell me all the time this doesn't work. 17 and a half years, I've walked around classrooms and looked at kids with textbooks sitting at a table, a chair, and see their head down see them depressed, see anxiety in their eyes, see them not understanding how this relates to anything. That's painful for a lot of us educators. For us that really want kids to love learning. And I know that every single person, if we did passion-based learning in this room, your desires and experiences would be the sole encompassing amount of learning that could happen. Everything you desire and want to learn should be a part of your educational experience. Makes it very, very difficult in a traditional system where you have 165 kids going through one teacher throughout the day. So you're going to see here how we try to make these ideas come to a reality in what we're calling the unschool.
Passion-based learning is finding your hidden talents and using them to enhance your learning rather than putting them on hold just to meet the standards of our rubric. So you can kind of see we blew it up. And I just want to stay, tell you that um, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And courage um, isn't absent of fear at all. So, I mean, it, it embraces it. And so, to show you what happens, when you blow something up, and I wore the Darth Vader tie, if you guys get the symbolism to the, the Empire, the, the Death Star blowing up, is that this concept had to begin at something really real. Um, and with the system that we currently have is so entrenched, I often use with the district, um, I'll say there's the giant hairball. I use that analogy of the hairball. And what I was asking Kent when we're going to create something different is I have to be able to orbit the hairball. You got to get away from that. So you can actually get out of those the, the stuck ideas. So we had to blow it up. So with that, ex that expectation is we did. We blew it up. You saw in the video the box. And then I like to quote uh, Buckminster Fuller, cool name too. Uh, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something. Um, to change something, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete which is a huge point for us. That means you have to start somewhere. And what we've asked ourselves when we meet this deviance come together is we know that the students are in the center of our practice, but that means our practice needs to be at the edge. We have to be willing to take chances, do things that other people haven't done to see if that learning can be successful for us. Um, that's a huge point in this, and I think that's the part that actually allows us to get kind of uncomfortable and that's when your best learning happens. So I mean, when Hemingway won the Nobel Prize, when he talked about why he won for Old Man the Sea, he said he was finally able to reach uncharted waters. Um, when, you talk, when you listen and read about scientists, they always talk about that point at which they're a little uncomfortable, fearful, that, that takes that courage. Um, they've experienced a lot of failure. It's when they're at the edge. It's, and we know sometimes in this process, we'll have to come back from the edge. There's things out there that pull you back. There's, there's things like testing and other things that sometimes it, it just grabs you, you know, you're going to take a step off the ledge, but you quickly want to know this is where we should be. At any point, too, um, you realize that if you're at the center, you're probably taking up too much room. So that's, that's probably important. So with this um, model, um, when I started doing this process, I talked to hundreds and hundreds, thousands of kids, not only from our district, but I started talking to them in other states. We, took, we went to conferences, and I'll get into more of that. Um, but the process, the process quickly you become aware of that our students enter a world of education, this world, and it wasn't built for them at all. They walk into it every day, and it wasn't built with their desires, or it, it wasn't built for them to be successful. It was built in some other idea. So, by interviewing kids, I was quickly able to find out what is it you need for learning. And what this picture is here is us taking an MP room and making it a global learning center, making it a place where kids started telling me, I want to be able to be flexible, move tables around, chairs, create a space where whatever it is I need to do that day, I can create that. Not telling me where to sit, not telling me how to sit, not telling me I need to sit, I might want to lay down, I might do work a different way. So working with students and their ideas, we came up with this different idea. Now this is only one of the spaces in which we'll be utilizing. The other space is more of what we've come to learn as more of our hacker maker space lab. Um, when you look at this, when the students first come to this school, our goal is for it to be completely empty in that whole L section, like Tetris style piece. The reason why it's completely empty is because after interviewing students, <coughs> It makes me very presumptuous to be able to assume that I know how any person in this room would learn. To ask them to design that model in which you learn. Maybe they do need to build a desk or a chair built to their specifications using special equations, using different types of wood that are better engage them. Maybe it's more earthy than that. Maybe it's hay baled. Whatever it is they think they need to have, this space here would allow us to create that. Even better yet, if we experience failure or realize we don't like it, we destroy it and move on. Because it would be a concrete floor, wash it out and go. Maybe it, our classroom is a 
Volkswagen bus that we bring in and we build and make it solar. I don't know what it is yet because I don't have those students. But what I do know is every single student I interviewed was passionate about learning. I hear all the time when I was interviewing that teachers would tell me the kids aren't motivated. Every interview I had with kids, we weren't asking them the right questions. My first question if you did capturing your story online is, when are you most excited or stoked to be alive? Every student I interviewed answered that question. And every single time it was answered, it had to do with something they need to learn still, or want to learn, or have been mastering. So I knew every single student, when I talked to them, was geeked out about learning. So that's an important thing for us to realize as educators, that every single one of you in this room have something you're interested in. And for us to be passion-based means we're actually getting ready for a pedagogy that would fit the 21st century world, where we're going to have to prepare them for problems we don't know exist. So that passion-based learning really fits into that. So that space here allows us to be imaginative as much as we need to be. We can create things, destroy it. Kid might want to set up, a, start an entrepreneurial business. They build that space out, we'll make that possible. They try out the business, it fails, it succeeds, whatever it is, we can destroy it and move on. So our goal there in that middle is for the students to envision whatever it is that it, they, they need. A maker space will fill with the proper tools that we'll need, obviously train, we'll have those type of precaution, everything. But you'll have that space where you have your master tools. That's a nano door so we can open up and bring bigger tools outside. Um, the other Nana door up there, those are big doors that open up. That's so you could bring a car in, more like whatever it is we're working on, a uh, boat. And then you'll see a different learning style over there on the, the learning suite. Um, anyone familiar with Daniel Thornburg at Apollo Alto? There's something called the primordial learning styles. I love this about learning. Um, that style up there, you might have be familiar with a camp uh, campfire style. That's what I'm doing now. I have a group, you're listening to me, you're obviously interested in something, you showed up, so you're getting that experience. That experience, we want to have a space, so if we have to have an engineer come in, a parent that's a great at music come in and the kids want to hear about it, we want that space. It very well likely be students um, during a presentation of learning, because we'll do a authentic learning, we'll get into that in their assignment, that their presentation will be occurring in that space. Depends. But we want to make sure we honor that campfire space is very important and human part of our learning. The other space, can be defined as possibly um, the water cooler space where you're working with a team of people and designing or building something. It also might be what he calls life. Those things you just have to do, figure out at any uh, point in time as well. The last space that you could use might not even be in that space, but it is cave time. It's for you to be introspective about your learning. If you ask your students, when I interviewed students about this, one of the things they could never find at a school when they were just transferring classes, class, classes, was ever a time for them just to sit down and write in a journal and figure out what they were learning. Super important for your primordial learning styles. Every one of us needs downtime. And the problem with a traditional school when you're going class to class to class to class, you're doing 60 minutes of math, then all of a sudden bell rings and you're supposed to go to the next one. At no time probably in your life do you function like that. There's probably not a bell that goes off and says that you better stop that activity you're so interested in right now and just totally switch and do something different. It's really crazy. It's not human. Um, so this type of space allows for those different learnings to occur. Um, and I think it's also important for me to point out that when interviewing kids, um, we kind of, and this is something we all have to unlearn, is that learning happens outside of school a lot. And sometimes I might argue even more than it's happening at school for a lot of kids, especially in high school. Um, so that's a big part for us to unlearn that concept and kind of relearn that learning happens outside the school and one of the things the unschool is going to try to do is bring that into the school and take us out. So if our learning needs to head to the river that day or head to the capital or head to the library or head to a local garden or head to an elementary school, wherever it is that we need to go to address that learning, that we open ourselves up to the idea that, you know, great learning occurs when you're not inside some contrived walls with the title of a school on it. But I also kind of want to tell you a little bit about why I'm excited about this project. I've been involved in San Juan um, as a teacher for, I think it's my 22nd year. I, I, I'm credential in social science, but I've taught a lot of things other than history. Um, computer applications, computer programming, digital video production, audio production, um, robotics, uh, and probably a few other things that I'm forgetting right now. And uh, thank you. And, I want to tell you just a little story about why Gabe thinks I'm a deviant. And this was long before I met Gabe, but I used to work at Churchill and I was teaching history. 
And um, I had a friend at that time. He is now a teacher, actually, at Mira Loma. And he came to me and he said, yeah, we just did Science Olympiad. And you know, darn it, I wish we had some building events because um, we just got beat, probably by that gentleman standing right over there, um, at Arden, by like four points. And if we just would have been able to build, have a couple of these building events, we might have won. And I said, I build stuff all the time. He said, well, will you be a Science Olympiad coach? So the next year, there I was, I was a Science Olympiad coach. So I had no idea what I was doing, but I saw kids that were excited. So we were building things like trebuchets and robotic cars that move billiard balls around and all kinds of stuff. I had no idea what I was doing. But together, the kids and I were figuring it out. And pretty soon I had a drill press in the back of my room. And then I had all these other tools and I turned my room, I was teaching history like from you know, 8 to 3 and then at 3 o'clock it became this big shop and we were building all this kind of stuff and people are going, what are you doing? Custodian was like, you can't have that in here. I'm like, Shh, just... So yeah, I, I break the rules from time to time to get stuff done because what I see, when I see kids, first of all, when I see kids excited, I love that. But when I can be excited with the kids, and for me it's when I don't know the answer and we're figuring it out together, that's what really excites me, that team effort. And we also have on that side there, there's a big point when we oh. interviewed kids, yeah. this internship piece. Kids constantly asked, I need to know about what I'm interested in and what I'm not interested in. So when I interviewed kids that had been part of internships, it was great. I met a, a girl at the Met down in Sacramento and she said, I want to do everything fashion. So she had an internship twice a week, something that we're looking for the same model of putting kids in internships at least two times a week so they're out in the field. Um, when that occurs, they're able to go out and say, you know what, I thought I liked fashion. Guess what? After six months, I hate fashion. But what I do know now is I really liked working with the women that I was working with and we found out there was a need there and this particular student went into working with um, organizations to support battered women. And that's what she got inspired by, which the following year led her to policy development for women. So without that experience, she would have no idea. And part of that also comes as a principal in this district. I can't tell you how many times after the end of a first year teacher's career, they walk into my office, sit down and goes, I'm $50,000 in debt. I, wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a teacher and I don't like this. That's a big mistake, right? What decision are you making now? But if we give students, and they're asking for this, because I interviewed them and they said, what's it like to work in this industry? If we give them those experiences in high school, imagine what they know. And my favorite part is, is that failure piece. I know what I don't like, which sometimes I feel is better than knowing what you like because it allows you to experience new things. So that internship piece when we were working this model, um, we want to build that up so students are able to do that. And we'll get into how that's possible in the design coming up. Um, Gabe touched on something I really want to reiterate, and we've said it a lot. Failure is not a bad thing at this school. Um, yeah, I'm a really terrible guitarist, but I'm trying to learn. And I build guitar effects pedals. You know, you get the plans offline, you build them. And I just built one last night, and the thing doesn't work at all. And so now I have to go through and try to troubleshoot. I can either throw it away, or I can try to troubleshoot and figure out why it doesn't work. And that's what I'll probably be doing over the next few nights if I ever get home, trying to figure out how I failed. I will fix it eventually, but failure is not a bad thing because I'm going to learn so much in going through the process. And that's why I like stuff like robotics, because it never works the first time. And you have to figure out why it doesn't work. Failure's not a bad thing. I learn, I've learned so much from my, my failures. All right, what do we have next? Aha. Got this one? Yeah, do So um, Nina, actually, this is right out of her journal. We went to a great conference at High Tech High. We've heard other people mention that. But there's actually something called deeper learning. And, there's, and the reason why this works is, and these are some of the competencies, that when you come out, you should be able to do these things. And if you do these, learning can be more powerful. That means it will be longer lasting. There's a lot of research on um, kids that took the AP test. They got fives. Three months later, they go back and test them. They, didn't, they couldn't pass. Zeros, ones. Why is that? Simply put, they're not engaged in the learning. They were trying to memorize it for a test and then quickly took what's called a mental dump and then memorize something else that 
teachers are expecting them to answer questions. So the, the idea with deeper learning is you might be doing less things, but you're going to go into it so deeply and be passionate about that experience that you remember it. So the goal is still mastery. Very much. So the, the, our, our ideas with the school are more based on mastery because that's, that's the goal of learning. Um, students also, through this process, think critically. They solve problems. I mean, you can see those up there. Collaboration, academic mindsets, how to learn and communicate that John kind of brought out. We've interviewed a lot of students being through this process. Um, we went to Florida to work with Big Picture and got to meet a lot of the kids that, that work in the Big Picture schools from Rhode Island. It's amazing to hear them. And one of the most fascinating things is they all admit the first six months are brutal because they're unlearning, they're deprogramming, they're, they're figuring out, they've been told what to do in school for a long time. So there, there is a moment where you're going, wait, you're not telling me what to do, I can't just produce something. And that experience that we're talking about is students need to know it's really hard to do something well. I'm t and I know that as adults we know that, but we've experienced that pain of like, oh my gosh, I can't just turn it in and walk away. A lot of students have been taught that they can do their paper, walk away from it and be good. And then I'm working on a site plan where every six months I'm redoing it, trying to make it better, do, work on, and that's real. What we've asked them to do for so long isn't real. I don't know any job where you do that because you're always trying to make things better, improve upon it, fix it. And we've taught kids this really insane idea that you can just be done with something. But the reality is to actually do something really well is really hard takes a lot of work, and we have to embrace a lot of failure for most of us to be successful. Ah, this is a cool one. So this is, um, you know, this is kind of look at our advisors, and, and we... <laughs> Notice it's the same person. It's the same person. So the idea here is that at any given time, if I went to Mr. Lester, I went to John and said, you know, I need help getting a job at this internship, then he might show up this day like be this. that guy. And there's another day that says, oh, you know what? My dad's radiator broke in the car. It's my project. I want to weld a new piece. I want to see if it works. We need to do some tests, some weld tests on it. Or we need to figure it out. And he's a different guy that day, right? So, I mean, it, it, it's capturing what we're trying to capture with this idea of getting rid of from the, uh, the teacher and going more to the deviant advisor is saying that we'll have to have a real relationship with the student to know on a given day who you are. Am I pushing a little harder today to get them going? Am I trying to help them figure out a problem in their life outside of what would be traditional school? Am I trying to solve a problem they've been working on with them that's going to get us a little dirty today? Or am I heading out to an, uh, an internship where we're trying to figure out you know, the best way to, to get a job or to, to fill out a resume? Project management's a huge, par huge part. We need to teach students how to, how to manage their own projects, but that might not happen for the first couple years. Well, we hope that it happens the last couple years they're with us, but for the first couple years, they probably will have absolutely no idea how to manage a project, and that's something that we need to teach. We need to, um, to manage their personal learning plans. Progress monitoring is a huge one. We actually went back and reiterated this Made it slide <laughs> as we, because it's evolved over, over the time that we've done it. Um, because a lot of parents had concerns. How do you, how do we know that, that the kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well, because that's our job. We need to be monitoring this progress. And we'll do that in a variety of ways. The great thing about it, and usually we have a third person here who's, who's off a, uh, being, getting an award. Getting an award tonight because he's a great counselor. He's our district lead counselor. And, uh, and he likes to say, you know, traditionally, if, if a student is not doing well in school, you may have a student conference and you might say, okay, well, we'll tell you how they're doing or, uh, or you'll get a report in three or four weeks. We will do it in a day or two. We can have a conference if something isn't working out. We can make some adjustments, and then we can have that feedback in like 24 or 48 hours because of the way that we're going to interact with students. So I think that, that we'll get a lot more um, individual monitoring of what's happening in this type of a, a style of education. Scott Evans, the lead uh, counselor who's one of, on our uh, design team, he'd probably come out and you. say that the first thing he'd tell you is he doesn't feel like he's a deviant. And he tells his story about... Um, he's good at following the rules. He's a counselor. He sets people up. He gets them through. He, he makes them get through every hoop they need to be able to aspire to what they need. He's great for our team because we make him a little deviant. He shows us where the lines are. It's a, it's a really nice relationship and he's been a great part of this. So these are his slides. I'm going to do my best to 
do well with these slides as he's uh, at CLMS right now um, being honored, possibly winning uh, educator of the year for high schools. Um, so he's in that first iteration. So our dream with this is, is to kind of set up that traditional schools, if you hang out down here in this umbrella, really focus on academic performance and academic behaviors. Most of their energy goes into that. What we're trying to, at this school like this, where you're 25 to one with an advisor and you have these superpower teachers, I'll call them, uh, you have a math credential, a science credential, an English credential, social studies, and you have these close access to these experts, is we feel like we'll be able to focus more on these learning strategies, these academic mind steps, and these social skills, which has been proven to be immensely important. So with that, those academic mindsets can, in, a, in an environment like this are easier to grow, belonging to a small academic community. When you do research about successful small schools, um, and by the way, these are all online, you can get them, so if you, you can take pictures, but um, it's all there so you can keep it. Um, belonging to a small community is much easier. Um, and all that, you can read those, but success, understanding these values is really, it's a lot easier at a small school. The next slide, to me, where we focus on academic performance here, it's where we kind of adjust where we put that. At a school like this where we can focus on authentic assessment we've been talking about, where kids are doing a project and presenting it and being, it's more than the, just the academic side. It's honoring other things that schools we feel like when I interviewed students weren't being honored. It's acknowledging actually the industries outside of academics. Very few kids that I've taught in my life end up as a college professor and that our system is really guiding you to end up a college professor. We're gonna go through college, you end up with this whole mantra. But really what we're looking for is these thinkers, producers, um, improvers, and builders. The people that make these economies run. Um, and we wanna be in a school like this where you honor hacking and making and these projects is put academics back down with those. And understand that in a different light that all these are important versus just that one focus where so many of our students have been left out of. Um, we do have a lot of thinkers. I meet with them all the time. They're often kicked out of classes. They often don't like it. We have producers that are out trying to make things. When John was going through those slides, it's, it, it's interesting for me that you don't learn soil systems because it's in chapter three, right? I mean, you don't learn that. You learn soil systems because your project with John is you're starting a garden and you wanna be able to deliver the proper fruits and vegetables to the local food bank to help people in our community. That's the project that you learn why that works, that connection to your heart, which we know that's where learning really is gonna occur. That heart influences your mind. Your mind then helps your hands do the work. That's a lesson that when they apply for college, they can go into and, and have that in a portfolio saying, here's how I help cure hunger in my local neighborhood. Very different than chapter three, answer the last 20 questions of the book. And those are the pictures that I have on my phone, which are so painful that I, I started with saying that it's got to be a better way. That type of project I just explained to you, so I date myself a bit here when I say that rad was a really cool word back when I was in junior high and elementary school, so I used everything was rad. So the idea here is that we'd have rad projects, and these rad projects all start with that top box of relevance, the realm of the student, their personal interests, what they're about, and with that, uh, brings in some really important things about how students, um, if Scott was here, I wrote it down, he talks about this expectancy value theory. And that is when a student um, is given the proper expectation, they know those competencies, and the values built in, that's their passion, the end result is you're motivated because it's something you're passionate about. So starting with the student, and that's listening to the student voice about what they're interested, that's the key to these projects. Now that doesn't mean there's not a connection to the disciplines. Everything in this school, we're trying to make multidisciplinary. That's to say, you've been taught this whole time on the Carnegie unit, that math occurs in 60 minutes, then science is gonna occur in the following 60 minutes, English is probably gonna occur in another 60 minutes, but in the real life for all of us, they're intercepting all the time, they're, they're all one. So understanding that projects actually have all the different disciplines built in. So that's the part of our advisors, to be guiding the students. If your project you're doing this, here's the competencies you're hitting, this is what you're gonna master by that, how do we amp that up? Because you said you wanted to accomplish this much math in this project. We're gonna have to amp it up, or more science. Or that's where the advisors come in to help guide the students saying, this project gets you this far. You wanna get this far? This is how many credits. 
The last piece is that authenticity part. This is that part of that internship that we brought up. Students always said, common questions, how is this relevant? Well, if they're interested in something and they're doing gardening and we have them working with soil born farms on their internship, we just answered, they're answering the question. How every day when they go to that, you know, that couple times a week when they go to that internship, they're able to see real life how this works. And that's a key to understanding why learning is so valuable to us. So our RAD projects try to encompass those, those three things. So the relevance, the authenticity, and the disciplines. And Scott does a great part of this. So I kind of said there's kind of a secret to this. And part of that is if you, um, as I, as I kind of said, doing something out of the box, you've got to find the right ways to get there to get what you want out of this. How we do this is in an independent study type school. So if you're under that model, you can still go every day, but you can be not seat based, but production based. What that means is you can go to an inter internship for a day and you can do other things away from school. It means we can drop school on a Friday and go to a maker's fair on a Saturday. It means you can do a lot of different things with that module. So if you're in that, in that defined thing, if you can do project hours. The way that works is, we'll still have credits in the school. I don't know how to blow that up yet. We will try eventually. But right now we're stuck. So that's part where, where I said we're at the ledge. I just got sucked back from the ledge. We're talking credits again. So in order at this point to get students through, we have to have credits. Every 16 hours equals one credit. So we're able to now, if you started out the school, you end up saying, I don't like it, and you wanted to go to a different school, you could break down a project, say, oh, you've worked this many hours, you've done 32 hours, that's two credits towards math, that's two credits to this. So every 16 hours equals a credit. Um, with this, there's other ways that we want to allow students to have access to curriculum and learning. Um, one of the ways is, if you're really into AP, we don't want to say no to anything. You can take AP uh, courses through Scout, UC Scout. We'll have access to independent study courses if there's something you want to take. Online courses we'll have uh, access to. CTE, we're working on working with the CTE and having our teachers also authorized with CTE courses. Um, dual enrollment in community college, I can't emphasize this enough. At UnSchool, we're going to allow students to take community college classes for credit in the school as well as you get to keep that credit for college. Um, so we're asked a lot by students, hey, could I graduate early? Yeah, if you really want to leave early out of a cool school like this, you can do it. Um, but you might love it, you might stay a fifth year, I don't know. Um, so that's another way. Uh, and lastly, it doesn't mean we can't write A through G courses. Once again, that's coming back from the edge. You can write your own courses, and Scott's been working with me, we've been going through. It's not actually that hard to do. We've actually talked to people that could help us do that. You could write, we could have students help write us courses if they wanted to. So that could be its own project in itself, is coming up with those and getting them approved. So here we're just trying to open the expansion and just say like that's kind of all the different ways. So um, if, oh. before you go, so the other thing I want to point out here is that these are the tools that we use to create a personalized learning plan for each student. For example, if a student comes in and says, I'm a writer, I want to learn how to publish a novel. Um, okay, we put them with our superpower English language arts person and maybe get them an internship and they go about learning how to write a novel and we say, where's the math in here? And they're like, I don't, that's, math is really not my thing, I'm a writer. Okay, you got to have math credit somewhere. So that's where possibly an online course comes in. So they're working on their project but at some time they go over and begin to get some of their math requirements on an online course. Compare that with another student who comes in and says, I'm really into engineering and so I'm going to build this and okay where's your language arts? Um, we might be able to get in there through them actually writing and reflecting about the project but there are literature standards and things. Again we have online courses. We also have dual enrollment courses at the community college. So as Gabe said a student who is very advanced in math we may not be able to handle their needs but there is a place that can and they may be taking some high level math courses getting high school graduation credits and getting college credits with dual enrollment. Our goal is to not stop anyone within the system, but to open the system to them so that they have a personalized learning plan that gets them where they want to go. Okay. Yeah, that was good. So that leads us to um, students making that next decision in their life. Um, and one of the first things I wanted to be able to point out is that when you look at this, there's other ways to get into college. We've kind of been prepped that A through G is the one way route. And I've been on the phone with UC Davis, I've talked to Sac State, and it is a way. 
There are other ways. Um, there are tag agreements, which if you start out at a, a city college and you take a number of units, you can have an agreement, if your GPA is so high, to automatically guarantee your admission. So that's another way in. Also, there's ways to test into college. You can actually take an SAT or ACT and test in. Um, and lastly, there's a way in uh, through exceptional, um, through portfolio, which isn't utilized that often. So when I was on the phone with them, I was trying to get a feel of what this means. And I'm, I'm quoting evidence that, you know, the things you're using to measure you know, students before they come in doesn't work. And they, were, they said, yeah, it's not very good. But we don't have an answer. So I've been working with them to try to come to like, form like a board so we can start talking about other ways learning can be honored and, and things like that. But it's also important to say that anyone that applies in California from outside the state didn't through, do through A through G. I'm originally from Oregon. There's, we don't have A through G in Oregon, but you can still get into Davis. You can still go, I mean, I went to Davis. But there's just, there's something to remember there that every um, transcript is looked at individually. So when I was on the phone with them, they kept reiterating that. And the transcript we're trying to make is going to be able to honor the projects that we're doing right on there. So we're creating a transcript that would show and highlight, like if your student invented a patent, it should be on the transcript. Those type of things we'd want to honor and say, or worked at and did a project that helped with food bank, started an entrepreneurial business for t-shirts. That should be able to be something on a transcript. So we're working to prototype that as we speak. So there are other ways in, and Scott does a much better job probably with these slides than me. He talks about the, tra the tag transfer agreement yeah. guarantee where you take, is it 30 units in community college? 60, I think. 60, and you're basically guaranteed entrance into uh, six of the UCs. Yeah, I don't know if it's UC or CSU or whatever, but point being, students can begin to work on those community college uh, credits during their, their, uh, their stay at UnSchool. Right. So we added this slide, I think, after our very first one, because uh, one of the uh, questions out there was like, is there any research to any of this? And I was like, well, I read books all the time. It's like kind of what I do. So I just, this is a picture of a, stack of books I had at that time. Mm -hmm. I've got a new stack of books, but there's tons of stuff on this works. I mean, each one of you, every time I've run um, uh, a World Cafe or any event, I, I often ask people, think about the time in your life that learning was the most powerful. When I ask and talk to people about this, they rarely mention anything about school. They tell me about a great event with a parent. They often tell me about a time they got in trouble and learned a whole bunch about it. <laughs> Because that was really impactful to them. That time they cut school and didn't make it back and everyone found out. They learned a lot about how to manage things and what was really important. But that's so human. And to honor that learning experience is what we have to be able to do to understand that learning's happening all the time. And just some of these authors, I mean, Chris Edmonds, amazing, um, if you haven't read those, but understanding the, the art of hip hop, but these are just some of the ones that I've read, I've read a bunch more, but there's tons of research and if you go on our website, I have a whole bigger list of books that um, you can read or check out. Other things that were asked when I asked that, and yeah, that's Sir Ken Robinson, anyone know who he is? I gotta meet him this summer, super cool guy if you haven't ever heard uh, creativity, schools do schools kill creativity, number one <laughs> TED talk of all time. So I had a chance to hear him speak, uh, John was there, he didn't want to be in the picture. Um, <coughs> So we got to meet Ken Robinson, uh, but we've been to the deeper learning, like I mentioned. So we've, we've gone out, we've been to the big picture. We went all the way out to Florida to meet with them. Um, uh, DSX is a school, uh, David Clifford, who contacted me today, he's trying to invent a school very much like what we're doing. So we're partnering with people and he's, uh, one of the reasons I'm filming is so he can see that today. They're amazing. Um, high Tech High's on there, Young Makers, Understanding uh, High School for Recording Arts, a, cr a crazy fun school that learns through um, recording. Um, the Met Downtown's been great when I've gone to see them. Uh, seeing a movie like Most Likely to Succeed, anyone seen that? We actually hosted that in the district last year. Uh, D School, Scott and I actually got accepted in D School with this project in Empathy Thinking. Um, so we're going in February to work with Stanford um, about the theory. Uh, anyone heard of the 20% time? The 80, so it's been in uh, businesses forever and we're offering basically at a school like this where kids can actually have 20% time on a daily basis to investigate and learn things. If you follow MindShift, tons of great articles about mindfulness and, and, and how do we explore learning. Uh, research on ELL students doing better in a maker space than in a classroom. Um, but just, just so you know, uh, there's also money given. Hewlett Foundation are giving money. Uh, there's uh, the Walton Family Foundation's giving money to stuff like this. And we have Nina here that works on grant funding. There are interested people in looking at learning in a different way. So yes, there's research out there. It's on the website too. We have a whole um, piece there. I think 
question the answers. We, we're at that point. Now at any point, if you've heard enough, uh, please don't feel forced to say, because we're going to open this up to you guys to ask questions and uh, see, what you, see how you can challenge us. Um, so we can do that. Uh, again, everything you heard today, like the reason this is so disorientating is it's super messy. And you're probably experiencing right now, how is this going to work? We don't have all the answers. I'm not trying to, I don't want to fool anybody with this. This isn't about um, having a perfect set plan because learning is messy. But what we do know again is we know what's worked for students and by interviewing a lot of students and adults and professionals, we know what's, what, what, what will probably work better. And we've been to schools to see how it works. So although we might not have all the answers, you guys will help us as we build the school. So that first years as we're building it, it's going to be part of that whole design team. So we're working with an engineer now, uh, the engineers and the, uh, the builders um, that are going to help us retrofit this space. We have an architect. So we hope that as the students are in, and we're about half full as of today, um, we're going to hope and we're going to invite students out once we get the hiring done. We're working on that right now. Um, we'll have you out to be a part of every step of this. So if there's something you're super into, you want to meet with the architects, they'd love to meet with you. I've had them talk to students already. So we want you to be a part of every part of this school because it isn't our school, it's, it's going to be the student's school and we'll be with them. That's a great question about growing the school. Right now our goal is to start with 9th and 10th and then grow to 9th, 10th, and 11. Um, if the desire is in the community and we're doing, and it's going the way we project, there's a way for us to grow down too. Our, our dream is to be like kind of a 7 through 12, 250 kid school. Uh, when that happens, I don't know yet. But we do hope to include um, students in middle school. They have that desire. Tough questions. Um, so what is big picture? I don't, I wouldn't even feel comfortable trying to, because all their schools are so different, one. So you have schools that are part of their network, like high school for recording arts, which are, the only way to get in is to be kicked out of a district or come out of a penitentiary, you know, in jail. So then you have other schools where, like Met Downtown, which has gone more to a traditional style. They have more classes now and work, they call them workshops. So I couldn't tell you. Uh, I would um, say, you know what, I, if I had to, if you put me in a corner and said, what is this? I would say it's all the way back to Dewey at the turn of the last century yeah, oh, okay. who said you learn by doing things. Yeah. It, it so I think we're going all the way back to Dewey. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Sudbury, you know, where you kind of go yeah. in and, and figure out the, what it is that you want. The democratic schools. Yeah. And the, yeah. It, it's got that little bit of a flavor to it, but it's intriguing. Very intriguing. Yeah. So tough. Those are tough. Yeah. Tough questions. I, I think of learning as being once again about the learner. So, I mean, that's what we're talking about. A lot of those names are trademarked and things. When, what really sold me on this type of education is when we actually talked to students who were, when one of the conferences we went to was all student run. There were teachers and adults in the room and it was students that were running the, the conference. Like, well, that in and of itself is kind of strange. Then these, and I'm actually learning from these guys that are 16, 17 years old, that's pretty amazing. And confident. But yeah, but ta in talking to them, it's like there is no separation. It's like they are ready for the adult world in a way that I have not seen. The way that they advocate for themselves, the way that they take ownership. And you say, well, what do you do if, uh, if, you know, if a student isn't, isn't doing something? And they say, well, this is what happens. This is what the teacher does, but it, you know, ultimately it's on us. You know, I remember they said, uh, uh, everyone makes the same mistake we have these deadlines and they're not enforced and everyone at first blows through the deadline they just don't treat it as a deadline and then they learn at their presentation of learning that oh my project is terrible right now because I didn't do that deadline and I didn't get peer feedback they said we all make that mistake but we only make it once and then we learn the deadline is there to run your project through your peer group so they can give you feedback so you can make it better 